um, to provide a little bit of context for our audience, I wanted to start with a general question having to do with what was it about America of the 1950s and early 60s that set you on the path of creating an alternative or counterculture? Everything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was, a, it was a very stultifying time. It was repressive. It was gray. It was dull. It was confining. Another word? <laughs> it was bad. It was. It was. It was. Um, it, it was too. It was too. Uh, too repressive to withstand itself for too long, and the reason it was so repressive was for the wrong reason. They were tr the our the the people the parents of the fifties had come through hard times, and their grandparents had come through hard times, and they wanted good times for their children, and they gave them everything. And you know, when you do that for your children, it has a bad effect. It does. <laughs> well, you know, it was father knows best, and <laughs> a lot of women aren't gonna take that <laughs> for too long, but uh, really, it, it was the stultifying, as you said, that part that, uh, and I had countercultural parents, actually, from a, a different kind of culture, but nevertheless. Uh, and I didn't want conformism. I wanted to get free, free and freedom. That was what uh, much of the counterculture was looking toward, and that was what I wanted out of it. When I think of the 50s, um, I think that everything I wanted to do, I was told I couldn't do. Um, not so much by my parents, who were actually quite supportive, but just the society itself. Um, I think as a girl who was kind of active and exploratory, um, you know, the sports I wanted to play, no. The games, the instruments I wanted to play, I mean, just sort of everything felt like the boys were the ones who could have the fun and um, not the girls, and so that was, I think, uh, that, as you said, Alexandra, it just couldn't go on for too long, um, and <laughs> we just had to break out of that, right? Um, I found that um, as I was growing up, I knew that I would leave the place where I grew up. I knew I would leave the small town where I grew up because it was too constrictive. There were too many expectations that you had to do the right thing, and I wasn't sure that I'd wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> but, but the lines were drawn. There were, there were black and white, and if you stepped over the line, you were gone. I got gone. <laughs> you know, doing the right thing seemed to be somebody else's idea. We wanted to do the right thing for us. Mm -hmm. And so that self-expression and individuality became really important. I, I want to share early on that I had an epiphany on the way down, and that was I was really the black sheep of the family and almost had a nervous breakdown, actually living where I lived, but my parents actually were wonderful people and they laid the groundwork for me to be able to come out here from Ohio mm -hmm. and to have the courage for that and to have the strength that my mother gave me. She stood up to everybody that was um, ever treated me wrong in a way that would really damage me. And I appreciate it now, but I don't think I appreciated it to her, and I wish I would have. And my father, 
was equally wonderful. He showed me how to garden. He showed me how to have compassion for others, a, a million things. And my rebellion was not against the way they raised me. It was the dominant culture and um, mom and dad, you did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> This, this is probably a good segue into another question, and that is um, what values you had that were counter to the mainstream um, that you wanted to express within this alternative that you were creating? So what values did you hold dear? I'll just say a few words. Openness, sharing, living simply, transparency, um, loving one another, not being negative, not being exclusive, not telling secrets, you know, mm. all of, uh, anyway. Um, there were a lot of values that were so meaningful that I didn't even know that I had them. It wasn't an intellectual thing. It was just slowly evolving. It wasn't like a list was made of this is what I want, you know. But I think there's threads that hold us together and connections and massaging those connections and appreciating those connections and being positive, you know, it is what motivated me and a lot of other things as well. But love, the summer of love is a beautiful way of putting it, the love part. Mm. Mm. That, wonderful, that wonderful happening uh, in the park where the musicians, the great musicians, who, who were made, could have made billions of dollars and actually did, you know, when they played at, at the big venues, but they played for free at the park. And that blew my mind. I thought, you know, that was just, that really tied into my values in a big way. Mm -hmm. I, I worked with a group of people in the Haight-Ashbury who were called the Diggers. And we had, um, our values were based on everything is free, do your own thing. Mm. <laughs> you know, self-expression and the ability to create uh, what uh, moved you um, to... Uh, I wanted to live in a place that felt right and in a way that felt right. And I had been in uh, an environment that had looked down on me for religious reasons. And I just didn't feel at home there. My parents had always thought that uh, being an artist was the, the very best thing you could do. And I didn't know what my art might be. But it gave me an opportunity to explore all kinds of different things and discover myself and that self-expression. And I'm really fortunate that the work I did has then inspired many, many other people to be, uh, to feel that they could be artistic and um, be self-expressive. And pretty soon, you know, we were all wearing all those things on our sleeves, you know, <laughs> all the things that we cared about, the symbols of, of uh, freedom and uh, conviviality and uh, uh, liberation. I would say that um, early on, it was sort of a sense of injustice in this society. Um, and a little bit later for me, when I started taking psychedelics, um, just a deep knowing that we're all one and that we're all connected and that um, that's the most important thing is that we, we take care of each other and that we that these notions of separation and trying to accumulate a lot for your oneself is kind of a 
bankrupt notion, really, and that we, you know, that whatever evolution that humanity will unfold will be because we're moving together. And it's like what you said, Sally, about massaging the connection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm glad you, you mentioned psychedelics. They actually didn't find their way onto the list of questions. Um, but I wondered if any of the rest of you wanted to speak to the role of psychedelics in, um, in shaping your values, in shaping your vision of the kind of society that you wanted to create. Well, I'm interested in, in speaking to that. Um, you know, I think it was that uh, when we were smoking pot in those very early days, uh, it was in a very small group, and it was very dangerous, and we were scared that anybody else might know, and uh, that what it did was it began to drop the veils of, between uh, our inner experience and what we had been uh, downloaded by the major culture, the, uh, uh, the mainstream. So those began to uh, uh, dissolve and we could see that, uh, the, and then LSD did way beyond that. You could really take any kind of question into an LSD experience and uh, find your own answer to it. You, you could find all of those answers inside yourself, and that was fabulous. But it, the, another thing that it did was that it uh, showed us that the uh, mainstream who had been telling us that uh, marijuana was uh, a habit-forming drug that would lead to um, uh, narcotics, and that it was untrue. And that uh, we began to say, oh, these uh, other gen this older generation, the mainstream has been lying to us. Therefore, what else have they been lying about? And that was part of what we discovered with that being able to listen to our own inner voice rather than that of the um, mainstream. My parents were of a liberal persuasion and uh, were really very understanding of anything that I did by way of counterculture and were themselves secretly countercultural people. <laughs> <laughs> they were very much against LSD, and they were horrified that I would even consider taking it. And one day when I was visiting them, I had sent them a picture of myself, and they said, we treasure this picture. This picture shows you at your most essential, perfect, <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> well, you know where this is going, right? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> That's great. I, I, th I think that LSD opened everyone up to multiple realities, that the possibilities were really um, much more than 3D. We went on LSD, how many Ds, how many dimensions were there? There were multiple, multiple dimensions and multiple, multiple possibilities. And on the other hand, um, the legal system made it such so that if you smoked, as Alexandra mentioned, if you smoked any marijuana at all, you were immediately a criminal. And that separated you from the larger culture that had been lying to you mm -hmm. and had been telling you some things were not good that were good. And I think that created an incredible community of people who were um, looked at as um, bad or criminal or something. And that, that solidified our uh, relationships with each other because we shared these possibilities of other realities, we were, in a sense, liberated. It also opened up the creativity gene, didn't it? Uh, for me, like, 
-hmm. all the colors and the the greens, there were like a hundred thousand billion greens, not <laughs> green, right? <laughs> and it solidified our feelings of nature, I think, and brought us closer, not just with the human beings here, but with the natural world, which was very important for the work that we did in the future. And it was an amazing amount of fun, but it was so far beyond fun. And people mm -hmm. that cry that they never got to do it, the pure acid and all that, I really do, I feel sad for them. I, <laughs> I, I do, and I hope that the, all that we got that they didn't, that we somehow managed to share with everybody this wonderful, wonderful, LSD and peyote and other psych mushrooms, other psychedelics. <laughs> I got to take LSD um, every third day, a small amount, for quite a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's being recommended these days. <laughs> Is it? Oh, ahead of my time, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> In all ways, <laughs> they're, they're, they're doing research about um, mm. LSD as medicine for uh, PTSD mm -hmm. soldiers who return with PTSD, and it's working. Mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. working. Yeah. I, I was going to ask um, a follow-up question related to what you were saying, Sally, um, about the connection between the use of psychedelics and spirituality mm. more generally. Um, the extent to which their use brought you into alternate spiritualities. Like you mentioned more of an earth reverent spirituality. Was that the case for? Everything was alive. Mm. Everything was pulsing with, and it was for me, I was lucky or whatever, good karma or something. Um, it was always beautiful. Mm -hmm. And when there were people involved, it was like, you just got deeper and deeper and deeper into those people. And like I say, trees and mm -hmm. all, all beings and yourself mm -hmm. as well. Do you remember how it was hard to talk to so anyone who hadn't had some kind of experience? <laughs> and you got so you could just tell by looking at one another. <laughs> You could tell just from the light in their eyes that this was somebody you could talk to and not be afraid to be real. And <laughs> yeah. Well, this is a, the next question is very broad um, and maybe an opportunity to tell stories. Um, what were your specific contributions? to this process of social, cultural transformation. Um, so what were you engaged in doing? What took most of your energy? What, what were your creative outlets during this period in time? What did you contribute? <laughs> <laughs> well, I can start. <laughs> uh, we. Uh, before, uh, I guess, 64, 65, um, there were a group of friends who were gathering and messing around with all kinds of things. And we uh, started something uh, that we called the Thursday Evening Tape Club, I think. <laughs> but it was really sharing kinds of trips, things that we had discovered. And uh, I had gotten hold of a Scott Paper Company uh, film on uh, menstruation. And we had no idea what we would do with this thing, but uh, we were showing it in, uh, in the living room, trying to say, well, what can, <laughs> in what way can we twist this? <laughs> and I, and it was a, there was an image of uh, these dots coming down a, a person's body, a woman's body, and the, this is the blood and how it, how it all worked. And, and it was about my body size, and so I stripped off my clothes and stood 
uh, underneath the uh, image that was being projected. And, it, and then I moved around, and it was like it wrapped around my body, and then the uh, skin became such an incredible screen that we went from there to our uh, Thursday evenings being in the attic with oh, six or eight sources of light being projected, like on um, you know light show kind of thing, or uh, a little eight millimeter movie camera, or several uh, projectors with slides. And so all of these were projected toward the this one particular uh, spot. And then one person would strip off their clothes and pick up some of these old real sheer granny curtains and, and kind of wave them around. And everything that the light touched, the images would show up. And it was incredibly beautiful. It was just extraordinary. And I had the ulterior motive of wanting to free people's bodies and free them so they could be in one another's company without having it to be about sex. It could or it might not be, but not in that environment. It was dancing, and we were dancing under the lights, and we were having this incredible time. People's minds were blown, and they stopped, they dropped their shame about their bodies, and I felt like I was being a very successful nude activist. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that went on, and that became one of the things that we went into a, a, a theatrical uh, situation and found we couldn't get away with it in public. <laughs> well, this is probably going to sound weird, but oh, that didn't sound <laughs> weird. <laughs> but I, uh, I think that um, the best thing that I did was to purchase a piece of land and allow people to live there, form a community, and not interfere with their with the, the growth or people in this community. And actually, uh, it still exists. It's working on 50 years now. And uh, I think the best thing I did for this community, besides not taking any money myself, was to move away. <laughs> <laughs> I came back. But yes, to move away. So that and when you give people something, they feel indebted, no matter how much you don't want them to, they will feel this way. And so when you're, when you're not there, <laughs> it helps very much for them to coalesce around owning ownership and stewardship and possession of the land itself and to have it be about that. Delia, in your community, um, did, did people work outside of it, or did you have community-based? Um, what did you do on the land? Well, f uh, farming, raising sheep, uh, creating a garden, uh, learning to live together. That was the big thing. So I was in this community for uh, about two years, and then I moved to a neighboring community, which was more of an art community. and. Uh, I was, uh, the first community was quite serious, and this other community was just not serious at <laughs> all. <laughs> and and uh, quite, we uh, were not allowed to park our cars next to our houses. We were not allowed to have telephones. We decided, I mean, there was no rule gone down, but we just decided we didn't want these things. And we had kerosene lamps, and um, ate together and played music afterwards. It was, that, was, that was lovely. And then took our sleepy children home through the dark, seeing with our feet. <laughs> Definition of hippie, doesn't wear shoes. <laughs> Did I live on the serious community or the fun one? <laughs> Wherever you are, it's fun, probably. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, 
so there's some of the people in this room where the best thing that I did was to meet them. Ramon and you here and uh, Michael Phillips mm. and Michael Eschenbach and mm. other, my niece, lots of people. Um, that was really, really important. And of course, writing my book, Raspberry Exercises, that with Robert Greenway, that was really important. And um, it's not only for the school part, which is a whole other subject of which I'm very proud, but also because it started me on my writing career and working a lot with Michael Phillips, which really opened up a lot of um, possibilities in my mind. And he, in my mind, was a little bit in the straight world, but much more in the <laughs> other world, <laughs> but both. And he could operate in both. And thus, I could operate in both, too. Because uh, heretofore, I just operated in the um, string beads and sew and make people happy. and But I never thought of contributing in a different way. And I'm so glad that, that I have that um, experience and I could help other people edit their books and publish books. And we wrote about, Michael and I, um, living in community and operating a business that was based on honesty and marketing your products without advertising, but because people loved what you did and you provided good service and all the good things that came from drugs and <laughs> life experiences in the 60s and early 70s. And so I really do feel like I made a contribution that will live on way after I'm an angel and lying around. So, some people in the audience may not know that um, alternative education, alternative schools were an integral part of the counterculture. Um, mm -hmm. what, what did your school do differently that regular schools weren't offering kids? Oh, it's a, such a long, you know who the expert is, is sitting right there. <laughs> Don't hide your face, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> he has written a lot. He actually looked at the, the Raspberry book, and that school uh, is not the same school as the one Delia was talking about. Correct? You, the school at Bodega. Oh yeah, no, no, no. That was, that's that a, was our, a our different enterprise. That's that's a different. Yeah. This was based on two. Um, my work in the city with, like, I don't know if your kids went there or not, but yeah, Diane De Prima's kids and Marty Ballin's kids and all the wonderful artists and people who couldn't bear to uh, send their kid to. A school, a regular school, let's say. On the back, there's a dedication. I gave you the book. Would you read it? Mm -hmm. Just on that back cover. The how long has it been since you taught in a culture which you fully believed? Yes, and mm -hmm. then inside, there's another one. In the very beginning. I think she said that one. I don't think. Oh, well. Oh, to yes. the millions of children still in prison? Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> um, we, I had the passion of um, working in the city in um, a school, two schools, little school, because my daughter was little and had to have a school, and then an older group of children that. Some kids didn't even read yet, and they were 12 years old. Mm -hmm. And I would go in a 
sit outside and they would sit in a closet because they were so shamed and teach them to read and um, so that lots of experiences in in those schools and I do have to tell you about one of the p parents was she and her husband are quite well known and they had these two children and they came to our school and they had their lunch boxes and salt plums. Mm -hmm. I, you probably never heard of them, it's a food. <laughs> and all the other kids would hold their nose and put down their school lunches and, and they were very um, not so happy anymore either because all the other kids got to go across with their little money and buy candy at the corner store, but they couldn't. So finally they figured out a way to get some money and go to the store and I let them because it was a free school, right? And about two weeks later after, I thought, well, they'll, this'll run the gamut, you know, it, they'll get sick of it. No, 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 one day at school, the little girl took her lunchbox and hit her brother over the head with it. And heretofore, she had been the sweetest, lovingest girl without her candy in the world, right? And so I believed ever more in um, the free school and what it teaches. Um, and I loved the experience, but the parents did not love me anymore. <laughs> but when I came up to Northern California to get away from all the hard drugs and stuff, I brought my school experiences with me and my passion. And Robert Greenway is a well-known eco-psychologist and professor and free speech man. And um, he looked at it from the professorial humanistic psychology point of view. And together we made a pretty good team and then we linked up with Sim van der Rijn, who was the state architect and his wife and their kids. And we had their, their kids and our kids went to school together and they'd spend half the time with us and half the time with them. So they learned all about the engineering aspect and the building from the van der Rijn part and farming and, um, dream sharing and sweat lodges and art and all the good softer skills from us. And we had a great, great old time, all of us. And then our students from Sonoma State would act as teachers as well, teacher learners. So that's part of the story of the book. There's a lot more, of course. I, liked it. Oh. I, I was just going to say, it's interesting. Um, I was also part of a group of seven women who started a school. So it's interesting just you know, as, yeah, either as mothers, as parents, but we all had the inclination to really be looking at the next generation and how are we going to raise our children, offering them some things that we that were missing in the world that we saw. Um, I, when I left Marin County, which was in 1972, I moved to Kauai with my little two-year-old daughter. And by the time she was three, I realized if I wanted to stay on the island, there needed to be a different school. My friend Rochelle is sitting over there. Hi, Ro. And um, she and I and five other women started a school like from nothing, like total shoestring nothing, like having garage sales to <laughs> put $75 in the bank to get started. And that school today, has a 40-acre campus and 400 students, wow. and um, <laughs> it's right. a great school. Yay. <laughs> but, but uh, you know, and it's a wonderful school. There's Hawaiian studies, and there's all kinds of you know amazing things. There was also something really special when we had 20 or 30 or 40 kids in the school, and they were doing Shakespeare around the island, and you know, so mm -hmm. the magic was, yeah. Did you have anything you wanted to add on schools before we get back to the original question, which was? <laughs> no, 
Well, I think I think it's obvious that all the all what was alternative education at that time has made its way into all levels of schooling now. Kids are are uh, encouraged to be creative, which was something I don't think I ever saw in school. And uh, the multiple kinds of studies you can do, even at the college level, you can choose your major. Your major can be various things. I think the, the education system has really changed. Um, they call it homeschooling now. They call it other kinds of schooling now, but it's it, it all started with, with when you have a child, you, you change your outlook on how you want this child to grow up and what you want, how you want them to be educated. And I think that's where it started. People, people recognized this and they, they made real activities and actions that influenced other people and allowed them to expand what education might mean. Mm -hmm. um, so back to the original question about what you did <laughs> within the counterculture, um, a story that maybe you'd like to share or okay. something you're particularly I, proud of. Um, after, the, um, I, when after I was on the bus with Kesey and we were doing these events called the acid tests all around the country, <laughs> with the Grateful Dead and light shows. And, and then Kesey got busted right after the Trips Festival and went to Mexico. And I came, I didn't want to leave the country. I didn't follow the rest of the pranksters and ended up over the next period of time um, st starting uh, the first all women's, women's band in the area here. And um, I was thinking about it when we were just talking about education. One of the, so first of all, there weren't women playing all of the instruments. There were some women singing and front, fronting bands. You know, Grace was singing um, in the airplane at the time, or Signe and then Grace, and certainly Janice a little bit later. But playing our instruments and singing, that was something we didn't have, we didn't, there was nowhere to look to see that. So, I mean, the first time we played uh, on a big stage in Marin, where we were elevated, we were thinking, well, so what do we do? Do we wear skirts? Are people going to lick up our skirts? Do we? we were like, oh, so Ambrose, our manager, was saying, well, what are you going to wear? We said, well, how, what can you drum in? You know, what can you? Play? So, I mean, just even thinking about what we would practically be able to wear to play our instruments. I mean, it's like we didn't have anybody to look at. Um, so we were making it up. Um, our our songs, our lyrics, were a lot about family and relationship, and, I, and I've been thinking lately that not very many of the guy bands that were our contemporaries, I mean, even though some of them were, be, say, fathers, they weren't singing about being fathers. They weren't singing about childbirth, and they were at <laughs> childbirth. Right? What was, you know, and it's just lately I've been thinking, why weren't they singing about those things, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, they, were the, they were catching the babies sometimes, but most of them weren't, like they had this image of having to be single and sexy, and maybe singing about family wasn't so sexy. Uh, I don't know what that is, I'm just thinking about it. <laughs> but yeah. I think that with Ace of Cups, we had five women, we all sang. We didn't have one lead singer. Hmm. And a lot of, when the record labels looked at us, they were like, well, who's your lead singer? Well. We all are. We all are. And the, it, that focus changed around person to person to person. And we loved singing together and backing each other up in different musical styles. We didn't have just one style. So it's, there was something that we kind of embodied and resonated. Um, I met Beth here just before the, we started, and she was saying how she came to see us at, uh, at Winterland and some other things, and how seeing us shifted things for her and made it possible for her to go on with her musical work, which she's done all her life. So I think we didn't set out to do that, but just embodying it ourselves, it had the ripple effect of opening up that possibility. So that's something I'm really happy about. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and we're still going. <laughs> that's amazing. I guess I would like to say one more thing. I think the age 
question for me now is like when I tell people that we're recording now, some people are like, yeah, other people look at me like I'm completely nuts. Like you are making a record. You know, like it's, you know, they just like your band that was together 50 years ago is now making a record. Like they can't compute because the the music industry is so oriented toward youth. And I think in those days we were kind of up against ideas about women that we kind of had to break through or break down or whatever we did. But I think the age issue now, sort of like women and women that are our age, that's a whole nother, um, <laughs> like a, a sea of opinion that we're gonna have to like surf through in some kind of good way, you know, I don't know. <laughs> another glass ceiling. <laughs> It, it, it needs to be broken down, you know, so however well, we're doing it, yeah. That makes me think about how important music was in that time. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, just going from my other story about the, the uh, uh, projected images, we, uh, various people, Ramon Sender, who's right down here, was one of them, Stuart Brand, the pranksters, uh, open theater, which was what uh, my husband uh, Roland and I were uh, con <coughs> connected to. Um, and I'm sure there were others. We, <laughs> start, we created the Trips Festival. And the Trips Festival was the big coming out party for the counterculture. <laughs> so, and, um, the uh, it had all these little things that each of our groups uh, uh, was presenting as our trips, our trippy thing, and we were going to do revelations, but uh, as it turned out, it it didn't seem like it was going to be a good idea. Uh, but we did. Uh, let's see. And Bill Graham, we had gotten to there to take care of the money. He had been the um, uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the mime troops uh, uh, manager, and we were all uh, kind of um, uh, w surprised. Well, w Bill went outside and he, to see whether there was anybody coming because the, his theater and our theater had had very small audiences, and and we weren't so sure this was all going to work. We were at the uh, Union Hall, the, Sher the Long Sherman's Hall, and he came, he went out to look to, on the Friday night, he came back in, and his eyes were like this, he said, oh, they're out the side around the block. <laughs> and it turned out that there were thousands of people who came through, and we had no idea, because all of us had been in our own little uh, living rooms, carefully smoking pot, <laughs> and, <laughs> and all of a sudden we saw how many of us there were. And it was amazing, but the uh, uh, and let's see, the the warlocks were there before they were the Grateful Dead, and uh, I, I forget who all else. But it, you know, there was there was, and what we learned from that was it was really the music that brought us together and able to to get on the same beat, and uh, that all those other little trips that we were taking were not going to do in a large crowd like that, what the music could do. So uh, there, because of the acid in the ice cream, <laughs> uh, there were some people who didn't know they, what they had gotten into. And uh, in, during some of the music, I think one woman's clothes had gotten ripped off. And we looked at each other and we said, we are not going to do revelations and have nude the event here in the middle of this crowd, I do not think so. <laughs> we would all have been busted before that night was over. <laughs> but it was the beginning of uh, knowing what the strength there was, and especially, well, it was that weekend that Bill went out and, and rented the Fillmore. Mm. So it was his beginning as he saw, you know, 
aha, here's the way to make some bucks. And the rest of us, went, and Roland and I said, I think we better go to Morning Star Ranch and do some meditation. <laughs> so we went a different direction. <laughs> But it was uh, there. We we discovered that music was the thing. Judy, did you want to share a contribution? I don't know where to begin. Uh, <laughs> the um, I think things really began during '66, and uh, there was uh, an incredible um, media. Uh, blitz to tell people to come to San Francisco. And the people that I was working with um, thought that we would be overwhelmed. And they, we had several meetings, including me meetings with the city. Um, the city thought it would be very helpful if they provided the tax squad to control things. <laughs> that wasn't what we had in mind. So um, one of the things that we decided to do, or the way we, did, we approached the summer of, quote, love, was to make a university of the streets. Our idea was the diggers were really performers. They, they came from the meme troupe. They were um, improvisational. They had a very creative, had a good sense of humor, and they wanted to do things that would, um, people could, could go to events, and we knew that all these people would come to San Francisco, but then they would go back to their home. And we wanted to give them an outline for a new society that they could take with them. So we, we put free in front of everything we had, one, the first thing we did was to provide free food in the park. But we didn't just provide free food in the park. We had um, a 12 by 12 frame that was painted orangey yellow. And we put the frame up. We fed them in the panhandle. We fed people in the panhandle. And you know, John Cage said, if you put a frame around anything, it's art. <laughs> and we thought the people driving down Oak Street going downtown would see this and want to join us, which in fact a lot of them did. So we also had a free store. Um, we had several free, uh, oh, and we called the frame, we called it a free frame of reference. <laughs> There was a lot of metaphorical language at that time. Um, we, we provided free news. Um, the communications company and the diggers uh, used Gestetner machines. Gestetners were kind of high-end Mimeo machines, like, like Xerox machines, but a little different. And we let people write things and distributed them free on the street. So there was free news. There was free food. We had a free store. Now, what is a free store? You go to a store to buy things, don't you? Or you go to a store to get commodities. Well, if it's a free store, then the situation is up for grabs. You can improvise how you exchange goods in a free store. As a matter of fact, during that summer, we had um, uh, someone from uh, Time Magazine and the Saturday Evening Post came to the free store and said, we'd like to interview the manager of the free store. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the diggers were anonymous. And so actually, P Peter Berg told one of them, um, this is the manager of the store. But he doesn't like to be recognized that way, so don't tell him that you know. And then he told the other one from the other magazine the same thing about the other one. They interviewed each other for about a half an hour. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So, so if, you ta if you take a society and you wonder what is real, what is reality really? Well, we acted out things. We called it life acting. We, we wanted to include uh, all these people that had come. We included the audience in our productions so that you, you were part of the production. You were not the audience for the production. And we did life acts on Haight Street quite a lot. There's uh, in the exhibits at uh, the, the Berkeley Museum, the de Young and the Historical Society all have photographs of the first really big event we did, which was called the Death of Money. <laughs> and we had a parade down the street. I, I, I won't describe the whole thing, but it was pretty impressive. <laughs> and uh, uh, we did a lot of other things. We did um, Lenore Kandel um, wrote uh, The Love Book, and it was um, prosecuted as a pornography. Um, but she wrote some poems, and we had big butcher sheets, uh, butcher paper sheets, and they were marbleized. Someone had taken them and marbleized them like the end papers of books. And then someone had taken calligraphy and written her poem on the sheets. There were about six sheets. So uh, another woman and I said, oh, I know what we should do with these, and we climbed up to the top of a building on Haight Street, and we held up the sheets of paper. They were so big, it took two people. And then spontaneously, some of the other diggers who were down in the street began chanting, reading the poem. So they read the poem, we, we shifted the sheets as, as was necessary. And then, of course, there was always an element in our events. I don't know how it happened, but the police decided that we should be busted for doing this because <laughs> even though they didn't know what was wrong about it, definitely <laughs> something was wrong about it. So we, we, we knew the people on the street said, the cops are coming. So we grabbed our papers, went down, before the police could come up, we were on a building across the street. <laughs> so it's kind of a cat and mouse game. It was a theatrical piece. The police knew their, their role and they played it out. <laughs> that, that's a couple of the things that, that we did. But we actually, um, I was at a, a, a press conference, uh, bef uh, I don't know when it was, maybe in January, and there was a man there who said that he grew up in South Carolina. And in his small town, um, there was a head shop. And that's where he first got turned on. And he said that the reason the man had opened the head shop was that he had come to San Francisco and was participating in an anti-Vietnam War march that was at Civic Center. But it went down the street. And when it got to the to Haight Street, he said everything exploded with color and joy, and um, uh, so if you, I lost I lost my punchline, but what I did want to say is that um, the diggers really felt that if you could provide basic human necessities, clothing, food, place, shelter, and celebrations. We did, we did free, free shows in the park all the time. Um, then you were free to live the most creative, most fulfilling life that you might like to leave, live. You wouldn't have to go downtown and wear a white button-down shirt. As a matter of fact, the free store got so many white shirts <laughs> That, that we just, someone brought, um, Luna Moth came down and she looked at them all and she said, I know what you need to do with those, just tie-dye them. And, they, that, and we taught people how to tie-dye and we tie-dyed them all <laughs> because then they were individual. They were not mass produced and they were your shirt that you made. And this white 
shirt had been recycled and transformed into something beautiful. That's, that's some of the stuff I did. So, something that's um, come up a couple of times that I wanted to ask about that again is off script um, is positive sexuality and the extent to which um, the counterculture was sexually liberating for you and, um, and other women. I can't wait to get my uh, tongue into this uh, subject. <laughs> I'm noticing that I, I just have the feeling everybody should stretch. Just stretch. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mm. Oh. Yeah. Yes. And now I'd like to sing you a little song. <laughs> <laughs> it has many verses, but I'll just sing one. It's called That Old Devil Jealousy. <laughs> oh, you said that I could love your man and it would not hurt you. And you said that I could take him and not take him away from you. Now you will not even speak to me. You do not know my name. Oh, leave me, leave me. You're driving me insane. It's that old devil jealousy knocking at my back door. And that old devil jealousy, leave me alone no more. And that old devil jealousy, leave my heart in pain. Oh, leave me, leave me, you're driving me insane. (laughs) I'd like to say something about that. shift that was happening at that time in North Beach um, when we first started playing. That was when all the topless clubs were up and down Broadway. Carol Dodo was pretty famous then. (laughs) So, right? And so there was this whole thing about coming to San Francisco and see those topless dancers, right? Um, So when Ace of Cups was first playing, it was kind of hard for us to get gigs and our manager, who's Ron Pulte, his wife's here right now, Sally, um, was calling, and he, she, he called a couple of clubs, particularly one on Broadway, and said, you know, I have this band, Ace of Cups, and they're all women, and, you know, would you like to hire them to play, you know, play a couple nights a week? And they said, yes. The guy says, yes. And so Ron says, well, yes. Do you, <laughs> Do you want them to come in and audition? And the guy says, no, 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 they they don't need to audition. He says, do you want to hear their music? No, no, they're all women, right? So as long as they'll play topless, (laughs) we'll hire them. And Ron called me up and told me that, and I said, call him back and tell him we'll play nude, but we won't play topless. (laughs) (laughs) They didn't want us. No, no. They, did, they didn't want us nude, and we, we probably wouldn't have done it, but, you know, that whole that thing was just so disgusting that we had to do kind of what more what Alexandra was doing. Like, let's just take off our clothes and be together, right? Right. But they were, they were not all about that at all. Yeah. I know, that was one of the problems, that our, our feeling was so free and actually pure. Naked, homeless, harmless... You know, but uh, the more and more the people who were looking at us were looking at us with very different eyes. And although I love taking my clothes off in public, after a while I just couldn't do it anymore. Sexuality, Gretchen. <laughs> well, maybe it's, not. it's fine. <laughs> what about relationally? Anybody else have something to say about? Oh, I what? wonder why everybody thinks that people of the counterculture were th- ripping off their clothes and having orgies, and 
all sorts of oddities, you know. I mean, it wasn't deep throat or behind the green door or stuff. I, I just don't know where that came from. That was one small group of people. And then there were mothers and families that probably didn't do that. And there are people who had all sorts of arrangements and uh, transgender relationships started to blossom and so much, you know, different than the Carol Dodo and the yeah, Mitchell Brothers <laughs> stuff. And I, I noticed in, in your book, you had a sort of uh, the Madonna, you know, and the slut <laughs> or whatever. And I didn't really experience that personally. And I wonder if how you experienced I, I th it. I think um, the society of the 50s was very puritanical. And so the fact that um, in the 60s, people were glorifying voluptuousness and sexuality and not hiding it behind the door is why, why so many people are drawn to that aspect mm. of what was going on. And I think women, women being able to claim their, our own sexuality yeah. and, yeah. And I, I and think, I think we're still working on that today. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, I mm -hmm. heard uh, some news broadcast that talked about some bimbo going, going someplace to do something. You know, it was just like, why are we still using those pejoratives? I don't know. Yeah, It was important uh, to the evolution of that, though, that 1960s, when the birth control pill became a, uh, available, and that liberated women so much that their own sense of their sexuality and their ability to express it in whatever way they chose to uh, became, uh, uh, from that 50s point of view, kind of uh, sullied. Uh, and we did, I remember, uh, free love and women's lib uh, were often spoken of in the same mm -hmm. context. And uh, there was a lot of confusion uh, in the general population about that. And, and other things that we're still working on vis-a-vis -vis sex is Coyote, you know, began in the 60s. Margot St. James and the mm -hmm. uh, union, unionization of sexual workers, mm -hmm. giving them some power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think one of the most wonderful things about sex in the counterculture was that it wasn't about sex per se, it was, uh, was about sensuality mm -hmm. and allowing yourself to uh, relate to other people in a sensual, open way without it meaning you were going to go to bed together. Mm -hmm. And that gets us back to the clothing part. Remember the velvet and how important that was for our sensuality and how we kind of, it was an easy way of sending out a message, like a peacock. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and being able to show your body. Uh, yeah, but that was the first step. You know, I didn't just go from there to there. You know, I had the, the velvet. Yeah, and the, the velvet silk. Silk. And, well, I don't know what guys did. But. <laughs> <laughs> did wear colors? Oh, right. yeah. I took their shirt off. Colors. Yes. Yeah, colors, yeah. right. Yeah. Long hair. Ah, oh, right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, embroidered and yeah. patched things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Being willing to kiss, fondle, and hug a woman without uh, either of them thinking it was going to lead to intercourse of sexual nature. It was intercourse of another kind of sensual nature. Mm hmm you know, they still carry briefcases and all that men do. I mean, I was like thinking about our version of the straight person was always the suit and the briefcase and everything. Well, it, 
if you happen to have a TV and look, it's still there. I, I don't understand. <laughs> what happened? What, the pendulum has to <laughs> stop. <laughs> I wanted to ask um, about the challenges or obstacles that you faced. Um, and I was thinking in terms of sexism, homophobia, hostility from the mainstream, parental disapproval, or in some cases, people taking advantage of the relative lack of structure or rules within your communities. It's open. You can talk about any challenge or obstacle. Challenges in the communities? Yeah, challenges or obstacles that you faced as part of the counterculture. It could be, hmm. oh. yeah. I, I think uh, it was challenging. Uh, I've always been community-minded, not commune-minded so much, you know, where the service you give to the community around you is really key to happy neighbors and not having enemies and shutting down because they don't believe as you do, you know, and f fostering that sense of community is really key to me, the broader community. So when you go in as a group of people and you embrace bigger and bigger and bigger, it's wonderful. So I personally never or very seldom encountered any resistance, except I had the door slammed in my face when I lived in the city a few times because people, landlords, had gotten ripped off. It was toward the end, you know, and they were sick of having hippies come and they could tell I was one, you know. <laughs> but otherwise, um, in the country, people were wary of us because, you know, they grew up for generations. They knew each other. And here we were, you know, what were we doing? There was a lot of us, but we joined the fire department. Some of us were nurses, et cetera, et cetera, builders. So we embraced them and asked for their advice and that really made a big difference, at least in my experience. It was good. I know, Denise, you faced a lot of sexism. The one that came to mind um, was a little bit later than, was when I, when I moved to Kauai, one of the things that I, when mm. we started the school and we were taking the kids to the beach all the time and I, I decided I should become an emergency medical technician because I just wanted those skills so that if things happen with the kids, I have more knowledge. And um, after I became an EMT, um, the hospital in Kauai was shorthanded, and they asked me to work part-time with the ambulance. And the, I was the only woman in, that had gone through that program um, on Kauai. And so I was in a class with like 11 guys, most of whom were firemen. And I was working, and I was actually really enjoying it, learning a lot. It's just a whole different thing to be around on a little island, you know, going to all the, uh, you know, the things that happen. Right? Every it was good. It was, I, I really enjoyed the job. It was challenging and interesting. And then the some of the the fellow who owned the company managed the company called me in one day, and he said, you know, I got a complaint from the wives, couple the wives of the firemen. They don't want their husbands working with you. Not a personal thing like me personally, they really didn't know me, but because there was just one room where we waited for calls, they you know, they just said, well, we can't have our husbands working with the woman, so <laughs> you, get, you lose your job. And, you know, uh. later that happened to the kind of the next woman who came up on the island and she fought it and won. But at that time, I was just kind of crushed, you know, I was like, I'm, I was really enjoying this work and okay, I just like crawl away, right? I mean, it didn't quite. They sent me to a different island and that really didn't work for me because I had a daughter. So, you know, those kinds of issues, I'm sure that you all have versions of something like that where women just um, 
when it when kind of push came to shove, the women had to move aside. Yeah. But in your music, you didn't get to, uh, record contracts, right? Yeah, we didn't. I, but I, I, you know, I think early on when we were playing, it wasn't just that we were women, although that was probably some part. But it was really more the way that we approached our music, which was very feminine. The fact that we didn't have a lead singer, the fact that we, you know, that we were much more of a cooperative venture. Okay. And we still are. I mean, our record that's going to come out has everything from like a single voice Mary Gannon singing an Irish ballad with Irish pipes to psychedelic rock to R&B to, you know, we have a lot of different musical st styles because we all have different musical influences. And so, we, you know, I, I feel like it had to do with the, the fact that we weren't being bound, you know, because we all wanted each other to shine and have a chance to share our musical, like Marla came from an R&B background, Diane came from kind of a R&B and country, Mary Ellen came from blues and folk, you know, so we had all of these, Mary Gannon came from Broadway, you know, or whatever, you know, you know, so I think, you know, and we had a much more cooperative spirit, and I think that's what they didn't know how to, um, rally into or lasso into something that they could market. Yeah. yeah. The, you know, the, the diggers were, were a cooperative like that, but not, not only women, but men and women. And the way that we functioned was that if someone had an idea, other people would help them manifest their idea. And that, it didn't really matter if it was a man or a woman who had the idea. Uh, there were people, you did what you were good at. If you were good at having ideas, you had ideas. If you were good at helping make it happen, you made it happen. Um, and I, I had a similar situation happen at a commune where I was, where people had decided to be very, very politically correct and they organized themselves into work cadres to get things done. And um, one of my sisters, one of my extended family sisters, uh, one day said, you know, I don't think I want to clean the kitchen. I think I want to go and build fences with the guys or with that cadre. And the women were just appalled, <laughs> they were just so upset. They were so jealous. Uh, it was amazing. And I, I also want to tell, I want to tell you a funny story about another place where I was at a kind of communal situation where out in the country where the farmer next door had uh, hurt his back. And so we had volunteered to help him bring in the hay. It was haying season. And he had, there were two um, 16 year old kids, local kids, who were doing the haying as well. What, the, in order to do haying, you go out into the field and you fill up a, a cart with hay bales, and then you drive it back and come to the barn and unload it. So um, Nina and I were one of the unloading crews. And the kids were another unloading crew. The bales are very heavy. So the boys would, it was, um, they, they wanted to unload them as fast as possible. They were sure that they could get them done faster than any of the, the old guys, you know, the 30-year-old guys who were our friends. And so they were really fast, but Nina, said, well, they're all stacked in the cart. Why don't we just um, make them like a staircase and roll them down? We don't have to pick them up and throw them. We'll just roll them down. And we, we unloaded the hay, bale, the hay trucks faster than the kids did. <laughs> <laughs> they were very disappointed. <laughs> and I just got a notice that we're, we're getting short on time. I can't believe it's gone by so quickly. Um, so I wanted to move to the legacy of the counterculture. Um, where do you see the lasting impact on local, state, national, international level? 
I just want to say something quickly, and I don't know if it fits in, but I don't care. Um, <laughs> I, I think of Janis Joplin fairly often, and I think that she left us with something really good. Forget the accidental heroin overdose and all that. She was a woman who believed in being your deepest self and being exactly who you are. And I felt she was very empowering. She was to me, and I think to other women as well. And I miss her, you know, in our world. She lived not very long, not long enough, but she sang her heart out, and I want to set the record straight. She was not one of the guys, and if I see that again, I'm going to go to the ocean and scream. She was a deep, loving, caring, very, very intelligent woman. Okay, I'm going to add something to that. So we were in the same office with Janice. I just have to tell a little quick story. One night, because the band, we all lived together, and one night I got a call from Janice, and she's like, hey, Denise, what are you guys doing tonight? I'm like, well, I don't know, we're home. She goes, well, I am, I'm having a party, and I just realized I didn't invite any women. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so she thought she could get five with one hit, but it was so cute. Like, yeah, I invited a bunch of people, but there's no women. <laughs> So what did did the what did the counterculture accomplish besides changing the way we eat, changing the way we move, <laughs> changing the way we <laughs> relate? Oh, I, a few things, perhaps. Let me think. Uh, <laughs> 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 I don't know. Uh, let's hear from the audience. Do you feel that the counterculture has influenced your life? All right. Cool. Here's your answer. Anyone have any specifics they want to add? I, I made several pages of specifics, but they seem irrelevant. Everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Everything. Yeah, it's an outlook. It's a way of holding the world that uh, has changed. You know, you can wear your skirts any length, and you can have your hair any length, and. Uh, I did write a few things down because we really did want to change the world. We really had, we thought we were going to, and we thought maybe we'd put acid in the water supply just so we could. <laughs> but uh, the, some of the ways I, uh, I wrote this, and it's easier to do that than to try to remember what I wrote. So, <laughs> so uh, it turns out we did change the world if not the way we thought we would, through computers and psychology and alternative technology, through civil rights, gay and other rights of gender and sexual orientation, through recycling and reusing and looking at the costs of population out of control you know, with overconsumption, reducing, reusing, and recycling, looking, oh, I, that's put in there twice, oops, uh, exploring our ecological needs and the <laughs> inevitable crash with the future of a culture that was unwilling to change. We had a lot of ideas that we thought would make it environmentally and about war, and we were unable to get over the top with some of those, but we, we worked at it. Uh, and this brings us to where we find ourselves today. Now we can no longer ignore the danger signals ecologically or economically. We foresaw the need to live more simply, but sustainability as a concept was ignored along with the care that we have in our hearts for this wonderful planet that we call home. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, see, I see quite a number of young people in the audience, and I wanted to end by asking <laughs> you if you have any advice for younger people, particularly young women, who want to be part of the process of change. Yes. 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 <laughs> do it. Do it. Just be proactive. Do do, do what it. your passion is. Do what your what will make you happy. Follow your heart. You know, I think. Oh, sorry. Mm -hmm. I, I I think that young people are teaching me. Mm -hmm. 
That's the way I feel too. And I would say in a co-evolution quarterly, they interviewed people like about this like a long time ago. And I, what I said was, remember your friends and hang out with them like a quarter of the time at least. Don't pencil them in because you can erase them. <laughs> <laughs> And travel all you can, and don't be afraid. Take risks and jump off the cliff together. <laughs> <laughs> but you are doing it. I feel that there's a lot of young people out there making big changes and dedicating themselves to what needs to be done here. And, but don't forget yourself. Don't forget to travel. Don't forget your friends. Mm -hmm. Take care of each other. Mm -hmm. yeah, create the world you want to live in. Mm -hmm. And you said something to me once, um, Alexandra, about joy. Um, if, if joy isn't part of whatever you're involved with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like the, uh, there were some millennials in New York that were questioning what uh, they could learn from the counterculture, and that was what that came out of it was uh, that you had to make it a lifestyle, you had to uh, live it, and if you just resist, you'll burn out. You've got to have the fun, you've got to make it fun, or you're not going to enjoy your life. And I think you have to, we have to have more color <laughs> and more love. <laughs> Thank you all for coming out and uh, for your questions, and thanks to the panel for your insights and contributions. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, Gretchen. Thank you, Gretchen.